Hi, I'm Esther. And I'm Sean. I write about AI news here at Tech Target in Massachusetts. And I edit Esther's stories. We're here to talk with tech experts about everything AI and ChatGPT. Don't forget Google Gemini. Whether it's who's ahead in the generative AI race, the metaverse, digital twins, or even the latest in autonomous vehicles, we've got it covered. Right, Sean? Yep, we've got it covered. Welcome back to another episode of the Targeting AI Podcast. Our guest today is Jayesh Gawandarajan, Senior Vice President, Salesforce AI. Jayesh has a long history in the software world, working in senior leadership positions at Oracle and Avaya before founding his own startup, Minhash, in 2014. Salesforce acquired Minhash in 2016. Now, Jayesh leads uh, Salesforce's AI initiatives across the board. Thanks for being with us today, Jayesh. It's a pleasure to be here, Sean and Esther. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. If 2023 was the year of innovation in generative AI, what is the focus this year for Salesforce and the enterprise software industry in general? Monetization, safety, implementation? What are your thoughts? Uh, that's such a great question. I'd say pretty much all of last year was experimentation. All the CIOs and the CEOs we spoke to were uh, you know, incredibly taken by the core technology of ChatGPT and we're asking questions on how they could use that to sort of uh, ensure that they bring it into the enterprise in a way that's usable. We saw customers doing lots of prototypes, lots of proof of concepts. Um, and uh, and I think where they landed was, okay, we have a open AI license. What do we do with it? Uh, you know, what's next? Uh, a lot of the conversations were sort of in that vein, if you will. Uh, most of last year was about um, collecting data, ensuring that you're able to use it uh, for the use case that's high value in the enterprise. And this year, I think we're seeing that sort of shift uh, slowly but surely into real implementations, uh, into bringing, into selecting the four or five use cases that are the most high value use cases in the enterprise. Classic examples are how do we make a service person more uh, efficient? How do we, uh, a rock star salesperson, 10 times more successful? How do you make a marketing manager create campaigns that um, that convert really well? These are sort of some key use cases that are coming to fore uh, on the generative AI application side, and companies are looking to implement them. It's not easy to do that. You want to do this with safety, security, trust. Uh, as you know, the systems can, can go off. So you want to have the right guardrails in place to be then able to shape it into the right form. Uh, and then finally, uh, doing what is something that we've always done in building AI applications for the enterprise, which is measuring value, measuring uh, the output of the system, uh, ensuring that it is indeed adding value that you thought it would add, and then tweaking it to get to where it needs to be. The focus has shifted from uh, experimentation to you know implementation and then uh, capturing value from those implementations. Okay, so Jayesh, uh, fundamentally, What's the most important benefit or what are some of the most important benefits of adding generative AI to Salesforce's CRM, CX, and other applications? Um, I, I see this in sort of one of two ways. If you look at um, use cases that, um, uh, that are really great fit for generative AI applications, they sort of fall into two buckets. One set of generative applications are just content creation. As humans, we talk to other humans a lot to get work done. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration that happens, and there is a lot of heavy lift when it comes to that collaboration. In the case of um, you know, customer service, for example, um, if you are Comcast or you are an internet provider, the kind of issues that you see you know, in resolving a customer scenario or a ticket, many of them have been seen before. There's really no need to have a human sort of respond to it when it's something that has been seen before. There's a family of use cases where uh, you're looking at making humans 10 times more productive, right? And those are uh, scenarios where you're having the same sort of conversations back and forth through conversational automation, you know, whether it's email or text messaging of that sort, or embedding generative AI into the flow of work. So for example, if you're a marketing person, uh, you know, if you're creating a campaign of a certain type with a click of a button, if you could make it multilingual, that's hugely powerful, right? Something that used to take weeks can ha now happen in minutes. Uh, you can get a first draft. You, you still need to be able to make sure that it's sort of the messaging is correct, but it gets you 90% of the way there really, really quickly. And those are sort of one family um, of application. The other one I'll talk about 
more if you want to dig in is uh, what we call co-pilots, which are in essence going beyond just a, the ability to create content to being able to orchestrate actions on, on your behalf. I find it interesting that you're talking about basically increasing human productivity and co-pilot. You guys are obviously not the first one to do this like co-pilot thing. You have Microsoft, their co-pilot, and then what they announced, I believe, last year. Uh, is that what you're hearing from your users, right? The idea of like, are they, what's the word, receptive to this idea of increasing human productivity? And are they finding it useful? Or is it that while you're trying to increase human productivity, the AI is just not there yet? That's a great question. There are problem domains there where it is very clear that these systems are incredibly useful. And there are problem domains where they're less useful. Um, I think the problem domains where they're hardly of any use is a very, very small subset of use cases. Uh, they do exist. But for the most part, um, you know, they're, they're tremendously useful in scenarios like customer service, in making, uh, you know, sales, you know, a, a more human centric process where you can talk to a human when you want to, because all of the mundane stuff is sort of taken care of by the machine. So absolutely, uh, there are tremendous use in each of these contexts. Um, the second interesting area that uh, we are looking at with co-pilots is orchestrating actions on behalf of the customer. So for example, if you're a salesperson, a life in your day looks like creating a sales plan, uh, going through the sales plan and making a few uh, uh, you know, interactions with the system to go get some work done. Uh, if you had an assistant to do it, think of it like uh, hiring a really smart intern that you need to teach some things to, but that can do you know things on your behalf and do them well. Um, the guardrails here are very, very important. I think you talked about this uh, a little bit, Esther, uh, which is that where does it not work? It doesn't work uh, very well in scenarios that are not clearly specified, where there is inherent ambiguity in uh, the tasks that needs to be carried out. Um, but even there, these systems are doing a pretty good job of creating a version one plan, if you will, of what needs to happen and then interact with the customer to get that to be more specific and precise and then go get that task done. So a lot of these sort of systems are coming together, um, you know, in, in sort of the worlds that the implementations that we're making with our customers. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to get into the guardrails and trust in a few more questions from now. But before that, I wanted to ask you... Um, <clears throat> to explain Salesforce's open ecosystem AI outlook, and also if this is applicable, how does open source AI technology fit into that? If it does, great question. So from the get go, um, as we saw the whole generative AI movement take off, uh, one thing was very clear that this is going to be multiple winners, um, and that what's really important is to be able to use the right tool or the right la large language model for the right tasks. For those of us that have been building these systems for years, when you get task-specific systems, you can actually get a lot more efficient at getting things done. For example, if you fine-tune a model for a particular task, like summarizing email um, or summarizing dialogue, these are very specific tasks. You can actually go get the same work done that OpenAI is doing for you, but at a thousandth the cost of doing that. So with that in mind, one of the first things we did is uh, support and be part of an open ecosystem. Uh, we have built our own large language models. We have fine-tuned large language models. In fact, the top three large language models in the open um, LLM leaderboard on Hugging Face, as of today, is the top three are from our team. Um, so we do a lot of that sort of fine-tuning, which is task-specific. And what that means to customers is that they have a choice. There is a burgeoning ecosystem of uh, large language providers that are our partners. We work closely with uh, OpenAI. We have invested in Anthropic, which is a frontier model. And then for tasks that uh, there's clarity on how to get it done, um, you can create a task-specific model, fine-tune a task-specific model. The world we are moving towards is something called a mixture of expert models, which is a family, an ensemble of models that can be used to go get a variety of tasks done in the enterprise. And that happens when you have an open ecosystem. Kind of started to touch on this, right? The generative AI race and the idea of like how there's no one um, 
model that's going to win. Can you speak a little bit about what your outlook is that, especially as a, a vendor in this space? Yeah, I think sort of if you if you look at the kind of things that a large language models uh, does, it started out very simple. Like last year, when we all played with Chat GPT, it was very clear that they're great composition engines. They they write language really well. Uh, they're able to understand language really well. And then the large language models got better. They got fine tuned and instruction tuned to follow more specific instructions that are more precise, which made them a lot more usable than they were. That journey has continued, um, you know, in the same way where the front, what we call the frontier model providers, the you know, OpenAI and Anthropic are good examples of frontier. They're sort of pushing the boundaries on what that looks like. So then from a language and content understanding, language and content generation, they moved ahead to things like planning and reasoning, which is currently better on the frontier models. But the stuff that was important, equally important, that they sort of started out the, the path on with for language and content, all that stuff is being done equally well by smaller models and open models. So. If you ask me like where the world is going, I think we're starting to see real life use cases where there is a lot of planning and reasoning involved before you go get some tasks done. And there are simply tasks where there isn't a whole lot of planning and reasoning. You just need to go create some content. Uh, and if there's enough context, that can happen quite easily. If you think of the world in those two terms, then the frontier models continue to have a space to innovate and grow, which is planning reasoning, um, the ability to write high quality code, these are all going to be domains of large large language frontier models. And then there will be other models open and even small models that do the other tasks quite well. And then it becomes a question of how do you take all of these things, plug it into an ecosystem that's safe, secure, um, and is able to bring and where customers are able to bring in their own data um, without losing privacy and build applications on top, which is the entire stack that needs to get built on top of this LLS. Now we're going to start to get into uh, <clears throat> some of the ethical AI, responsible AI, trust issues. So I was actually really uh, fascinated when uh, about a year ago, Salesforce came out with the tr Einstein trust layer. Mm -hmm. And just the way it worked is kind of a middle layer reaching up and down uh, mm -hmm. inputs and outputs. Uh, how far is has that come along? How, how far has it been integrated into any applications and and how do you differentiate Einstein Trust Layer from other LLMs platform safety guardrails? Because Anthropic is well known for focusing on those as well. And I don't know if Einstein Trust Layer works different than Anthropic. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me sort of go a little bit slow and sort of talk a little bit about our sort of thought process for the for the Trust Layer. When we started on this journey, the two things that became clear is trust is both about privacy and security of our customers' data. But it's equally important that to understand that trust is also about accuracy of results. To make sure that the results are usable, you want to be able to trust it. And if the system hallucinates a lot, that's not going to work. So think of trust in two buckets. There's privacy and security and safety of customers' data. And then there is the accuracy of results tied to the job or the task that you're trying to do. So fairly early uh, in the cycle last year, we baked this layer in, you know, deeply into our Salesforce's AI stack. Our AI stack, uh, just to give you a bit of a background, you know, has data layer at, at its very core is a Salesforce data cloud, which is our data layer with all, where all the data sort of comes in. On top of that is where we, we train, test, evaluate, and serve large language models as well as predictive models. We call it the Salesforce AI platform that's built on top of data cloud. The layer on top is the trust layer, which I'll get into in a second. Um, and then the layer on top, the trust layer, is the co-pilot layer, which is emerging and something we uh, we announced recently. And then the, the very layer on top of the co-pilot layer and the trust layer is the application building layer, where customers come in and build the applications that they want by plugging in data into the data cloud, by building what what me what they need to build based on the use cases that they build. So within this sort of you know broader AI stack. Um, trust layer is one of the first things we worked on. Uh, it includes uh, a secure data retrieval layer. It includes mechanics for dynamic grounding, which is a fancy word for saying we enable customers to bring their own data and ground their actions in that data. 
it has built into its sensitive data masking. Um, what data goes out of the system is masked. So for example, if you have PII information, that will be masked before it goes in, goes out of the system. There are prompt guardrails uh, that's built in. There is zero data retention policies for third-party model providers. As I told you, we the stack that I described is an open and extensible stack, which means that we work with third-party customers, a third-party providers such as OpenAI, including our own models. Now, if the if the customer desires to use a third-party large language models, we still help out by ensuring there's a zero data retention signed between us and the third-party provider. So, you know, even if data goes out, it will it will not be retained. And then finally, you know, a few other areas: toxicity detection, uh, ensuring that there's an audit trail at every point. Things can and do go wrong, and when they do, you want to have a strong audit audit trail which we store on our data cloud that a customer can go look at to see what happened and then take corrective action as needed. Broadly, I'd say the whole trust layer policy, we bring together features, processes, and policies that work together on one stack, right? So that's sort of, you know, some of the components of, of the trust layer. Um, I think your second question was, how is it differentiated from the guardrails that large language models themselves provide and, and the safety? So we can talk a little bit about that uh, as well. We believe that it's essential to provide additional guardrails beyond the built-in protections and alignments that are in the large language model space. That is because a lot of these protections and, and alignments are tied not just to the technology in the underlying layer, but really what the user is trying to get done. Take that and couple it with customers' need and desire to have an open model ecosystem so they have the flexibility to use the right tool at the right place. When you bring in an open model ecosystem, you now need a layer that is bringing that sort of consistency in features and processes, safety processes, and policies, such that no matter what open model you pick from within the ecosystem, that that part is working and is working fine. Um, so it has to do with data privacy, content safety, and op open model ecosystem, which is why you need a layer that is building all of this. This is that is orchestrating, and this is kind of why we deploy trust detection models tailored to CRM use cases and uh, Salesforce ethical guidelines. So I have a quick follow up to that and then I'll ask my next question, but you mentioned an open model ecosystem. What exactly does that look like? What exactly do you mean by open model ecosystem? Uh, great question. So the Salesforce uh, large language model strategy is to provide an open model ecosystem for our customers, including third party model providers and our own models. Uh, Salesforce developed models, um, are, of course, available out of the box uh, on the AI stack, but customers can also bring their own LLM using something called BYOLLM uh, feature. And to support this level of choice and diversity, the trust layer is much is model agnostic, right? So, and provides consistent sort of customer protection for all the models through our LLM gateway abstraction. When I talk about open model ecosystem, I mean customers bringing their own models, tying it to specific tasks that they might want to do, or saying we really want the entire car. To give you an analogy, large customers want a lot of uh, flexibility and control, so they, might, so they might buy the chassis and bring their own engine and their other parts that they want to configure. And there are other customers who just want the full car built out, and we enable them to do both. The open model ecosystem is for people that want to bring in their own engine or customize the, you know, the engine and be able to use have have the other building blocks sort of fall in place for them. And that's what we, we provide. Going back to the idea of the Einstein trust layer, I think what you, one of the things that you mentioned before, uh, and I kind of wrote it down, is this idea of orchestrating action on behalf of clients, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, how does like Salesforce, with that, the fact that you have to orchestrate action from behalf of clients, on behalf of clients, how do you handle bias, right? Especially within models, uh, whether it's models that you're, you just bring in or within your own models. Um, and I know we asked about responsible AI before, but what about the idea of both implicit and explicit bias? And also, can you mention how has Einstein trust layer improved since uh, its first iteration? Uh, yeah, lo lots of questions in there. So let me sort of dig one by one. Let's talk about orchestrating actions on behalf of the customer. A lot of this work is, uh, you know, started by, you know, started by large language models' ability to orchestrate, you know, multiple actions and reason and plan in the action space. So what that means is 
um, you can give large language models some tools that they can call upon to get something done. And then when you give a higher order instruction to go get you know, a task completed or a job that you want to get done done, it will then figure out the right order in which to call those tools to go get that done. Coming to sort of safety, privacy, trust, those dimensions remain the same whether you're generating content or you're orchestrating actions. For example, you don't want to have the large language model have access to functions that you as a user of the large language model doesn't have access to. So the access and privileges that are tied to an enterprise user when it comes to data should extend to actions as well. There are some actions that Sean can do um, you know, because he has the rights to do that that I cannot um, you know, if we're working in the same company. And that should be respected, and it is, when it comes to this new world of co-pilot orchestration. The second is just safety. Uh, LLMs can still generate a harmful, biased, and inappropriate content due to biases present in their training data. Right? And this is why we deploy the trust detection models that are tailored to these use cases, right? so that we can catch these and we can correct them before they go back to the end user. And what would you say um, about responsible AI? The reason I'm asking these questions is because one of the problems that we have with generative AI, and especially because you guys are a vendor that uses use, is that um, some users might not feel, I know you have ice night trust layer, I know you spoke a little bit about bias, but some users might still not feel comfortable mm. with whatever the the model, the actual model behind is generating. And, you know, we've ha- we have all these problems that has popped up in the past couple of months with yeah. LLMs, yeah. with gener- uh, generative AI models, especially with, I guess, OpenAI, Google, and Microsoft, right? And so what are your clients saying about that? How are you guys handling those kinds of problems especially in your own product? Yeah, I mean, one good thing is that people use Salesforce for getting their work done. So we have less of a high bar than most other consumer-facing companies where the product is used by anybody out there for any particular use case. So there is some built-in guardrails because the stack that I talked about is used for getting some work done. Even so, um, I think enterprise users expect accuracy, they expect appropriateness, they expect the right tone, they expect the right style of content. And these are areas that we focused on, right? This is an active area of work for us. And the hard part, like you've surmised, is it's one thing to do this when you control the model, but if you're going to give customers access to an open ecosystem, that this becomes a harder problem because you have to, in essence, ensure that this this works across the family of, uh, you know, the open ecosystems model. So this is kind of an active area of work that we focus on, which is to ensure that there is accuracy, appropriateness uh, in both tone and style of of content coming back. Um, And then there is, I come back to the the safety aspect as well. Um, How do we minimize the inappropriateness of content? How do we minimize the bias uh, and the harm that can be caused by this? This is an active area of research and work for us. Um, We work very closely with our research team to build our own toxicity models. They are sort of open and we share them with the community as well. Uh, And these are hosted, um, you know, as part of our Salesforce AI stack. These are not LLMs. These are basically observers of LLMs and their out, uh, and they're themselves large language models, which, um, uh, and classifiers that uh, that catch toxicity and such an active area for work for us. And we continue to invest in that sort of trust layer. I want to go back a little bit to uh, your own internal models and to what extent. And two questions. One is, <clears throat> when you out of the gate, I think you adapted GPT for some of your stuff. And then now you're evolving your own models. I'm wondering how you build your own models. Is it with, do you use an open source foundation model? How do you start building your own model not using open AI stuff? Also, the relationship between the old Einstein AI, you know, the traditional predictive. Yeah. What's the relationship between that and Einstein Copilot? Oh, great question. So uh, two very different questions. Let me take the first one and can remind you the second one as well. How do we build our own models? So like I said, we have built, we have both built models from scratch. Um, and one of them is XGen, uh, which is a code generation model from Salesforce. And we've taken open source models and fine-tuned them to enterprise use cases so they work better and almost have state-of-the-art uh, results on that. Uh, and we're actually on the leaderboard for many of those. So those are two aspects. Um, as you know, model building and training, 
you know, has many steps. That is the very first pre-training step, uh, followed by reinforcement learning with human feedback step, followed by instruction um, tuning step, um, all of which, depending on whether you want to build it from scratch or you want to start with an open source model, the the key thing to remember is both the technology and the data to be able to fine tune to the use cases. Um, Salesforce's uh, ability to look at use cases end to end from the perspective of the end user to understand what needs to be optimized, what data needs to be collected um, so that the job to be done is done successfully is unique because we have that whole stack and the whole vertical view of what is being done enables us to get data and enables us to use that data with permission from our customers um, you know, in a safe, secure, transparent manner to, be, to sort of get their job done. If you, you know, that's, that's one way to look at it. So let's talk a little bit about the other question you had, uh, Sean, which is what is, how do predictive and generative AI elements come together? Um, in what form do they come together? Um, and, you know, how, and does Copilot help in one way or another? It, you know, in some ways, I'd say all of the AI we build is in service of some job to be done in the enterprise. Uh, if you look at our, our predictive AI models, we have ranking functions that, that sort uh, sales deals so that the order in which you call them maximizes your propensity to close a higher number of deals, right? Uh, that's, an, that's a classic example. Lead scoring is a classic example. Uh, you know, our ability to um, uh, get data, train models based on that data is, uh, you know, is, is true for both predictive and generative. The way I think those two systems come together in my mind is when you're trying to get a job done, uh, you're going to have some generative aspects of the job and some predictive aspects of the job, and you want to bring them together to work to, to finish the work that you're trying to do. Um, you know, one example would be: imagine uh, an account executive working with a copilot. They might be asking for a sales forecast. The forecast is not something that a large language model generates today. The forecast is a numerical problem. And there are very sophisticated forecasting models built into the Salesforce stack, which are, which are what you call predictive models. That is a part of the plan that is generated for the Salesforce AE. They're able to interact with this predictive model in new ways. They're able to interact with it as if, as if a human would, uh, to ask the uh, forecasting model questions, to be able to interrogate and get the output that they desire. And then finally, what are they going to do with it? They want to create a document on it. They want to create a, They want to send an email based on it. They want to be able to craft, you know, and take some actions, uh, you know, based on that. So that's kind of how it all comes together. What direction is the Gen AI ecosystem going in, and what is Salesforce um, role in it? Um, I think what we are seeing is widespread use, to me, of this generative AI um, platforms, sort of breaks into task orchestration, sort of an always on, always available smart assistant that has access to the same functions that you have access to in the enterprise and is able to do that on your behalf when you give it higher order instructions. That is one aspect. The other aspect is sort of what I call in the flow um, generative output. So the, the interface doesn't change. It's not like it doesn't look and feel like an assistant. It is still the work that you're doing, but and the tool sets that you're using are, are the same, but they're but they're 10 times more productive. Um, you know, a simple example of this would be you get an email from someone and the response is pre-written for you. You just eyeball it and hit, hit send. That is hugely productive. How can it do that? It can do that if, if it has access to all the conversations in a safe, secure manner to be able to generate that output. And that's what Salesforce's view is, is when we, the systems that we've built, the stacks that we've built enables you to connect data and respect the privacy aspects of that data and yet be able to create these amazing generative experience. One of the things we recently GA'd is called knowledge grounded email replies, which is you have a body of knowledge in, you know, in an organization or a company that's encoded in documents or prior email conversations that you might then want to bring together and say, use this to generate an output for me. I'm not going to go send it back to the end user, but you can write it for me and I'll, you know, I will eyeball it. Um, so this is one, one example of, of what I call in the flow uh, type application. And, and you've heard everything about Copilot as well, which is where the world of planning actions, reasoning, 
uh, orchestrating complex actions on behalf is where the, the goal, of course, is to have everyone uh, have a, a, an assistant that can, that can do work on their behalf, which is super, super powerful as well. Okay, so uh, I know this is not your area, Salesforce Ventures, that's a separate company, mm -hmm. but um, they just led a, a $1.25 billion funding round for Together AI. So it made me think of asking you not only what does Salesforce look for in making AI investments and what's your strategy in terms of investing versus acquiring? You know, Microsoft invests in OpenAI, AWS, and you invest in Anthropic, uh, Oracle invests in Cohere. People aren't making AI acquisitions as much. They're, they're, they're sort of, we like to think of it as almost patron-client relationship or a factory to do your generative AI for you. Yeah. So can you just talk a little bit about that, please? I am fortunate to be a partner, uh, uh, you know, an advisor to our Salesforce Ventures team. Uh, work pretty closely with them on uh, many aspects of sort of deal flow and due diligence and such. Uh, I've also been fortunate to work with the m and team. As you know, I came in to Salesforce through an acquisition. Uh, and having come into Salesforce, uh, my team has made several acquisitions that are part of our portfolio now. So it's, it's a good question. Um, and I think it has two different aspects. From an investing perspective, Salesforce's point of view is that we are building a really strong, robust, vibrant ecosystem of partners of, uh, you know, in the, both in the venture community companies we invest in and companies we partner with. Um, our, you know, uh, last year we announced a um, $500 million generative AI fund because we saw this happen right in front of our eyes. We were working with our customers, trying to make them successful. We could see what others couldn't. And we were able to sort of, you know, make the investments that we did. Our focus is core technology providers that um, that are building deep tech. It's also companies, startups that are uh, in the Salesforce ecosystem that are um, useful and successful and will be successful in the Salesforce ecosystem. Any company that we can help be successful is, is someone that, uh, you know, our, our companies will look into from an investment perspective. Uh, from an M and A perspective, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, the one that I'm comfortable talking to is making acquisitions that fit a very specific need in the portfolio. Uh, talent acquisitions and and such are are things that we do as well. To follow up with that, um, when we talk about AI, even before we started talking about Gen AI, there was this idea of like there's a lack of talent, right? And you just mentioned talent acquisition. Do you still find the same to be true right now with Gen AI? Is there still a need for a lot of talent, especially maybe for Salesforce or others like yourself? I mean, generally, from an industry-wide perspective, uh, for sure. I think anytime there is a tectonic shift in technology, there's always a dearth for talent on the new things. Um, it you know there's a, There's a period of time where that evolves and um, and new people come in to take that that place as they learn the technology and every aspect of the technology. I think the rate at which we're moving, just how fast we're moving, uh, I, I do think there's definitely a dearth of talent in the right places. Um, and I think, you know, over time, we'll see that sort of manifest as well. Okay, so Jayesh, um, if it's correct that AI cloud is no longer a focus for you, is that still a focus for Salesforce? Absolutely. Oh. This is so. Oh, it is. Yeah. Is all Make this sure. stuff underneath AI Cloud? Uh, I'd say in Trust Layer. So, just to give you some background, what I just described to you the data cloud layer, the Salesforce AI platform, the Trust Layer, the co pilot layer, and then the application layer that's sort of the new Einstein One platform. It's sort of the next generation Salesforce AI Cloud, if you will. And that's a new stack that we produced that we've built over the last year, year and a half. And that has all of those elements. Okay, so Einstein One is is really the platform instead of calling it data cloud, uh, AI cloud, you're calling it Einstein One, or is it the yeah, same? Yeah, we're calling it Einstein Einstein One platform, which brings together AI, data, and CRM. All in. Okay. So, final question for me is obviously, um, Gen AI continue to evolve. Uh, still, very a pretty new market. Um, Einstein Trust Layer. Um, you guys came out with that last year. How is Salesforce going to continue to evolve and continue to grow with this new market? Um, what are your plans for the future looking forward? Um, how do you plan to continue to, I guess, gain the trust of your enterprise? As we discussed before, I think there's sort of two elements to this, which is 
the ecosystem and our work continues to evolve in building you know amazing assistants for for humans and also to enable generative ai in the flow of work for our enterprise users you know our goal is to change how work is done uh, which is you know uh, you know an overarching goal but i think technology today is enabling us to do that in significant ways and we want to of course do this with in alignment with our core values which is trust and you know that's kind of why we built the systems that we built um from an ecosystem perspective we are very aware that um as we go into this new world we will need to do some reskilling of people we just recently had our salesforce tdx event uh where uh, we had lots of developers coming in and learning how to do the how to build copilots on salesforce stack uh, and this is the kind of reskilling that's going to be needed to bring the ecosystem along with us in this journey thank you for joining us there's where can people find you uh they can learn more about what salesforce is doing on salesforce.com uh everything to do with einstein you'll find there to connect with me find me on linkedin um fairly easy to find jayesh govindarajan and on twitter my handle is just jayesh so look forward to it thank you so much thanks for our listeners for listening we hope that you share and like this episode continue to tune in please feel free to leave us a review Thank you, Jayesh, for joining us. We really do appreciate and enjoy this conversation. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.